Hello, I'm Gretchen Sable, and I'm pleased to be with you today in this program. I am the new chair of a new organization called the League of Women Voters Upper Mississippi River Region Interleague Organization. This is an organization that's formed to promote and advocate for issues relating to the Mississippi River from its source to where the Ohio enters the river down in Missouri. I'm gonna be giving you a program today that I gave at our keynote as a keynote at our opening convention on October 24th. The title of this is Launching Our ILO, Protecting Our River, Bringing the Passion of Carrie Chapman Catt to the League of Women Voters' newest interleague organization. I'm going to be talking about a number of things, league, how league works, and also how the river works. So I hope you'll enjoy it. From the point, from the, in the spirit of the women's suffrage movement came a great idea that a nonpartisan civic organization could promote active and informed citizen participation in government at all levels. The League of Women Voters was founded on that idea on February 14, 1920, six months before the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote, was officially ratified. What you see before you here is the mission statement for League of Women Voters today. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages informed and active participation in government, works to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. Demog democracy is not a spectator sport. We all have to be involved in this. Today, the League of Women Voters is an organization of women and men working to increase understanding of major public policy issues and to influence public policies through education and advocacy. As you can see, there's more than 800 local, league, local and state leagues, and league operates at many levels. Local leagues in each of the states feed up to the state leagues, and then each state league feeds up to the national league. The, through this organization, league can be a grassroots organization where members participate actively in the formation of policy and and also take action at the local level where action is needed most. But unfortunately, it turned out that this was too silo-like, and so League has now begun in 1972 to have a new kind of an organization, an interleague organization that serves regions. You see on this slide a number of the regions where we have those kinds of organizations. They're called interleague organizations, and this was added to the structure of the League to help us deal with regional issues. One such interleague organization is the Lake Michigan Region, ILO, which works primarily on natural resource issues. It coordinates the efforts of 46 local leagues in the states bordering Lake Michigan, which are Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, and Indiana. You can see them there in the graphic. In 2013, the Lake Michigan ILO received a grant from the Illinois Coastal Grants Program to promote the ILO's environmental education program, Stormwater from the Ground Up. You can see in this picture the governor giving a grant to the League of Women Voters in a big event. So um, the, the Stormwater from the Ground Up program is a program geared at teaching people or helping people understand the, the issues and the opportunities around stormwater. The League observed that most people didn't understand how stormwater is collected and where it goes, and so the ILO developed this program to emphasize what individuals, communities, and regions can do to prevent and alleviate contamination and flooding. Over on the other side of Illinois, in Joe Davies County, which is Galena, Illinois, and in Dubuque, Iowa, those areas don't border Lake Michigan, but stormwater is also a problem there. And so leagues in that area, when hearing about what was going on in the Lake Michigan ILO, began to talk and think about what they could do to bring a program like that to their communities. So sitting around the dinner table where most good ideas happen, they recognized the idea of this interleague cooperation. And so the boards of the Dubuque and Joe Davies County and Cedar Rapids and La Crosse leagues began to meet and develop an upper Mississippi region ILO to deal with Mississippi River region issues. And so, so was born the LWV Upper Mississippi River Region ILO. Our formal incorporation was launched at this October 24th meeting, so fairly recently, and actually we're still in the processes of becoming a, a legal organization going through all the steps there. But uh, we are here now, and we're going to be, you'll see more of us as time goes on. With this ILO, even before the formation started, they participated with other groups to get a grant to work on education. So this can show an example of the kind of work we'll be doing. 
Um, the grant application was with the U.S. Natural Resource Conservation Service, and local leagues are contributing education component to the project. The project is called the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. Some of the things that League was active in was education of youth. You can see here a number of different um, events where League members were teaching st stream water monitoring, talking about surface water and how surface water works, and educating on storm water as well. They also did actually, they have a program of stream and spring monitoring that's still gone going. They put on a forum where they held discussion on different water quality issues which was a, a good way for people to kind of talk about things and understand things more, and we'll be doing some of those meetings. And they also participated in well sealing efforts. This is a well in Illinois, and you can see that the um, fellow is pouring clay down the well there to seal the bore so that surface contamination doesn't affect groundwater, which is another very important thing. Through efforts like this, we can also make our voices heard. By joining together, we're much stronger than we are singly, and we can affect things that travel up and down the river. So let's take a look at the river and the people and others who live here. The Upper Mississippi River flows about 1,300 miles from Lake Itasca in northern Minnesota to the confluence with the Ohio River at the southern tip of Illinois, and constitutes over half the length of the Mississippi River. In a recently released study of the economic impacts of this river valley, the study was done, I should say, was by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Upper Mississippi River Basin Association, and the Nature Conservancy. This study looked at 60 counties directly bordering the river. And what they found was in these 60 counties in one year, there was more than $253 billion worth of economic activity, more than 755,000 jobs. The key jobs are in manufacturing, tourism, and agriculture, and I'll talk a little bit more about those. Tourism and outdoor recreation alone support more than 300,000 jobs. So you can see for all those things, water quality is important and also water quantity, and so making sure that we take a good job of managing this river is important. Looking at agriculture, you can see here that um, there's a large amount of the soybeans grown in the United States is here in the Mississippi Basin. Um, agriculture is a major element of the region's economy, and there's a lot of exports that come here. This map shows the 2010 soybean acres. As you can see, most of them are in the Mississippi Valley. This is the corn acres here. Corn acres, similarly, are also in this watershed, and so you can see that agriculture is a very important land use in our watershed. In 2000, barges transported 122 million tons of commodities on the upper Mississippi, over half of which were grain for world export. About half the nation's grain travels the upper Mississippi to um, exit at the Gulf of Mexico and head out. There's 12 major tributaries to the upper Mississippi, including the Minnesota River, the Missouri, the Illinois, the Wisconsin, and Iowa rivers. The basin has 30,700 miles of streams. All the small blue lines in this map represent streams that bring water from the land to the Mississippi. 30,700 miles of streams is an incredible network, an incredible circulatory system bringing water to the river. Let's look at the river a little bit now. This is a, a familiar picture to Minnesotans. This is the headwaters of the Mississippi at Lake Itasca. You can see here that the river starts at just 1,475 feet of elevation above the ocean. So there's not a lot of drop in this river as it travels all its thousands of miles, 2,552 2, miles to the Gulf of Mexico. The river is flowing out to the right. That's the little footbridge you walk across there. And uh, the river maintains a trim figure as it travels through the Twin Cities. It goes through northern Minnesota forests and central Minnesota farmlands and the Twin Cities where it hits Lake Pepin and becomes a big wide stream with wide bluff, high bluffs on either side. Further south, the river valley includes extensive backwaters and wetlands that are home to all kinds of wildlife and people. Eventually, by the time the river gets to St. Louis, the floodplain is more than 50 miles wide, and it's an immense river, much different than it started at Lake Itasca. So many people and things take advantage of this river. You can see that there's 18 national, wild, national wildlife refuges along the upper Mississippi with almost 300,000 acres of national refuge. There's also a number of state refuges, local parks, 
private preserves, all kinds of things along here that help to keep nature natural. Um, the Mississippi, whoop, Mississippi forms a ribbon of critical habitat for all kinds of wildlife. It's also important for recreation. There's more than 500 boat access points like this between Lake Itasca and Cape Girardeau, Missouri, where people can get out and recreate on the water. I found this picture online. It shows, um, it's um, for Mississippi River rentals out of La Crosse. And you can see here from the advertisement, it's a highly developed recreation industry on the Mississippi. It's important both economically and for people's health and well-being. And of course, the river supports all kinds of creatures as well. More than 127 kinds of fish, 30 species of freshwater mussels. It's vital for all these things. Looking at the birds, nearly 300 species of birds migrate through the river valley in the spring and fall. The Mississippi River Flyway is used by more than 40% of the migratory waterfowl in the U.S. Uh, people use the water. More than 7 billion gallons of water are withdrawn from surface water sources every day in the 60 counties that border the navigable Upper Mississippi. More than 80% of this water is used as cooling water for energy production and is therefore returned to the streams and the rivers. There's 29 power plants that use water from the 1,300 mile long Upper Mississippi. And between St. Cloud and Cape Girardeau, the Upper Mississippi provides water to 23 public water supply servers serving a population of more than 2.8 million people. So these people withdraw water from the river, consume it, and then they return it. Um, 278 facilities discharge wastewater to the upper Mississippi as well, including industrial facilities and municipal sewage treatment plants like the one in this picture. This is the plant at Hastings, Minnesota. We have a lot of people that live in this basin as well. When you think about it, um, most of the people in this basin live in urban areas, including Minneapolis, St. Paul, St. Louis, Missouri, Chicago, Illinois, the Quad Cities, La Crosse, Wisconsin, Peoria, Illinois. This slide shows a, um, a recreational trip sponsored by the Friends of the Mississippi River and where people kayak the length of the Twin Cities Basin. So it's an interesting picture. That's St. Paul there in the background. There's a lot of common issues that unite leagues in the upper Mississippi and unite all of us in the upper Mississippi. A big one is that nutrients flowing into the Gulf have created a dead zone where anoxic, meaning no oxygen conditions, affect fisheries, shellfish, and sh shrimp. Poor water quality also affects wildlife along the river's route. So all those animals that we talked about that rely on the river for its habitat are affected. Um, other kinds of issues, the transport of hazardous materials by rail or on the water that can threaten water supplies. There's a, a, aquatic invasive species, such as invasive silver and big head carp. And also there's issues that aren't necessarily threats, but opportunities, commercial navigation, ecosystem restoration, water quality improvement, flood risk management, water supply. Many things unite us. We have them in common because we live in the Mississippi. Looking now, though at the dead zone in the Gulf. This graphic is very graphic. And what it shows is that all the material that travels down the Mississippi and the Missouri, this shows the Missouri and the Ohio watersheds as well, enters the Mississippi. And when it gets to the Gulf, the um, oxygen, the, the nutrients cause the algae to bloom, the algae grow, and then they die and they decompose. And it's in that decomposing that the oxygen gets used up and then the fish have no way to, to live anymore. So that's why we call it a dead zone. To address this dead zone, um, EPA has been doing a bunch of work, and this is the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Um, back in 1988, they formed a hypoxia task force. Hypoxia is that anoxic condition. They have an action plan for state nutrient reduction strategies that came out in 2008. And in 2011, they provided more guidance on how states were supposed to do this. Um, the nutrients that are being addressed here come from a number of sources, including municipal wastewater, industrial wastewater. We call these point sources. And then there's also non-point sources like urban stormwater, leaves and clippings, fertilizers used in urban and agricultural areas, and livestock manure. All these things contribute to the nutrients that flow into the river and flow into the Gulf and create the anoxic area, the dead zone. 
So each of the states in our ILO have now um, begun to develop these nutrient reduction strategies. Wisconsin has a strategy that relates to those plans and addresses Wisconsin's needs as well. They have been working to reduce nutrients and have actually reduced nutrients to the Mississippi by 23% and 27% to Lake Michigan. But that, because they're having success now, doesn't mean that, there's, that it's all done. Iowa, because Iowa has such a large corn footprint, has a lot of issues there that need to be addressed. Iowa is looking to um, make reductions from both wastewater plants and from agricultural areas. And as these policies and procedures are developed in the states, it's important that people are there to help, un help explain and understand and advocate for those policies. And that's what League of Women Voters sees as their view, as their mission here. Illinois likewise has a nutrient reduction strategy. And they, in Illinois, they are looking to move toward the development of nutrient standards that are numeric, which is a much stronger stance. And so as Illinois works on these numeric standards, they will need help in advocacy too, getting those standards adopted. Minnesota works cooperatively with a number of different organizations in their reduction. And as, now, as Minnesota is now rolling out their plan, they're looking more to have assistance from different groups, could be League of Women Voters, to um, help them promote and advocate for these changes. So it's a good time for us to be part of this. League of Women Voters is in the right place at the right time. We have um, the opportunity to promote education and awareness. We have skilled at advocacy on issues, and we are also very good at forming coalitions with partners. With the League's 95 years of lobbying and advocacy, we see the chief benefit of the UMR, which is the Upper Mississippi River region, being the ability to amplify the voices of our citizens across dozens of congressional districts. So what we're doing is we're getting a big bullhorn with this, and we're going to say we're here, and we're here to protect the Mississippi. Um, one of our members prepared a short video which shows the beauty of the river and really illustrates why we care so much about it. From the sky there comes a storm, causing thunderclouds to form. Lightning flashes like the sun and rain falls down on everyone, making puddles for the toads and clearing up our dirty roads. From the land the water flows and the Mississippi grows, 
its water flowing from the earth. How do we know the river's worth? At river's edge we watch the stream and hear the story's waters dream, passing through the gills of fish, then cleaned and piped to wash our dish. Sacred, common, safe to drink, what is flowing in our sink? Symbolic of our own return, please speak a word for water's worth. So, if you're interested in our work, we're a new organization, like I said, and we're just starting to develop our social media presence, so I can't say yet like us on Facebook, but soon we will be. Uh, for now, you can find us on the League of Women Voters Minnesota website by Googling LWVMN Upper Mississippi River Region Interleague Organization. Kind of long, but that's our name. And, um, and we will put links there to how to reach us in other ways soon. We'd love to hear from you, certainly if you're interested, if your organization in working on the river or in working with us in league, we would love to hear from you. Thank you very much. And thank you to QCTV for filming this. I appreciate that help as well.